Uh, this is actually our second week in the bay because Blair and I managed to get COVID. We have decided to stay a little bit longer so that I can actually hopefully recover and then get to spend some time with my grandparents. That does mean too that because I wasn't feeling very well, I didn't actually get a whole lot of reading done last week. But because I'm feeling better, I don't sound better, but I am feeling better, I have managed to do, do a bit more reading this week. I started with Social Cue by Kay Kerr, and this was just such a gorgeous, sweet romance. This is a story about 18 year old Zoe Kelly, um, who is autistic. She's just finished high school. She's in her first year of university and she's studying journalism or communications. And she's managed to land herself a pretty cool three week internship at like a media journalism. I don't know, they're sort of like a website, like a news website, but like a fun one. Um, she's managed to score herself an internship there. And she's also just decided to start trying out online dating. Um, she's downloaded a few apps and tried, you know, it out for a little while. And one day she wakes up with an Instagram DM from a guy that she swipe left on, on Tinder. So she didn't want to talk to him and he went out of his way to find her on Instagram so that he could berate her for not being into him. And so that sort of is a bit of a violation and she feels a bit uncomfortable. And so she decides that she would love to write um, for this media company that she's working for, love to write an article just about what it's like to be autistic, to never have really had any crushes or romance experience and to now be diving into the online dating world. It's a great piece and it does mean that this is sort of multimedia in the sense that we get um, the first person narrative from Zoe's perspective but then we also get her her articles that she's writing for this website and this first article goes a little bit viral and she ends up getting um, plenty of comments from other autistic people and just other women who have sort of similar experiences or can identify with elements of her experience and they really appreciate her voice but then there are also five comments from people who say they know Zoe and say that at some point they have had crushes on Zoe before she just never noticed it and so the editor of this media company sort of gives her um, a bit of a project to see if she can reach out to these five people and maybe go on dates with them otherwise just like have a chat to them and see what these signs were that she missed and just see if she can develop a bit of like a a series around it. And so she does. That is what this book is about, is about Zoe meeting up with these five people that say that they've had crushes on her, say that they've had feelings for her, um, and just like the different interactions that she has and what she learns about herself in the process. Some of them are people that she knows really well that are actually really good friends. Others are people that she maybe had a class with at uni one time and that she did like, but didn't really you know, ever get to know very well. Another is someone that she worked with, a part-time job in high school. Someone else is not very nice. Like it's a whole, it's a whole range, a whole spectrum. And it's just wonderful watching Zoe go through this whole experience. There are some pretty hard hitting moments, um, but I think they do an incredible job of demonstrating just how poorly misunderstood autism and the autistic experience is by so many people, even well-meaning people. I love, love, loved watching Zoe, especially setting up some really good boundaries with people in her life um, and just how she worked through some of the shame, but also like the challenges and stuff around her own experience. Um, but ultimately she, she really learned so much about herself and how important it is to take care of herself and how, um, you know, she isn't responsible for other people's feelings and other people's perceptions of her. And it was just so well done. It was delightful. It was a little bit funny, but also really sweet and quite powerful. I think it was really, really well done. And this is definitely a YA I would recommend. So that's one of the books that I brought with me. And I did actually do a whole video about the books that I was planning to bring with me. I didn't end up bringing exactly those books, but for the most part, those are the books that I'll be reading, hopefully in this vlog. Um, one book though that I did pick up since I've been here because it was an absolute bargain um, is The Underdogs by Kate and Joel Temple, um, Catch a Cat Burglar. Uh, this is like a junior fiction title that we do sell at work and I flipped through before, but I've never read it all the way through and it was just an absolute bargain. So I wanted just to pick it up and read it so that I can better hand sell it at work. Um, and it's sort of along the lines of real pigeons, bad guys, like that sort of vibe and setup for those of you who know those books. And it's basically about this undercover dog detective agency who isn't really doing super well. There's a cat burglar on the loose um, and they really, really want to catch the cat burglar so that they can, you know, they can get some clout and <laughs> their, their reputation can go up. And so they end up hiring 
uh, a cat to help them out. So there's a cat on the dog detective team, um, and it's just it's just quite fun, quite playful uh, little story about uh, these cats and dogs going on like a bit of a detective adventure. Super cute. So that's what I've read so far, and next up I'm planning on reading Amari and the Night Brothers, which is a book I've really been looking forward to, and I can't wait to see what it's like. Happy birthday <laughs> to you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, dear Abby. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Hooray! 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 Okay. Come over here, old. Come over here? No. No. There's the garbage man. to be a nine ten day holiday and turned into a 20 day mostly quarantine it felt like <laughs> but I'm home now and although I didn't get to vlog as much as I was hoping to in the day I thought we could have a little chat about the books that I read while I was away now it was just a very difficult couple of weeks not only did Blair and I get COVID I have developed a bit of a chest infection as a result so I'm still not 100% um, my grandparents aren't doing great, although I was very grateful to be able to spend uh, Poppy's 75th birthday with him, which was very lovely. So we've already spoken about Social Cue and Underdogs. These were both really great reads. I liked both of them, especially Social Cue. It's wonderful. After that, I read Amari and the Knight Brothers, and I'm so glad to have finally read this book. It's been on my list pretty much since I first heard about it coming out about a year or two ago. It feels like it's been out for a while now. And I know the second book is coming out very, very soon. This is a super fun middle grade fantasy novel featuring the incredible main character, Amari. I loved her. Basically, this book is about Amari, who is a 13 year old girl from memory, and her brother, Quinton, who's a little bit older, disappeared a year ago. The police and a lot of the town that Amari lives in think that he's probably dead, but Amari believes to her core that he is still alive. Although her mum is like a single working mum, doing it pretty tough, Amari does have a scholarship to quite a prestigious school. And she's really badly bullied and experiences a lot of classism and racism by her fellow students. Then one night she gets a delivery. It's a secret delivery just for her, and it's from her brother. And his sort of hologram meets her and basically explains to her that he has been off in some magical world, he's seen some incredible things, and he wants to nominate her to be able to go to the same magical school or academy that he did. The hologram Quinton doesn't know a whole lot about what's actually happened to the real life Quinton, whether he's dead or alive, uh, but he's really excited to offer Amari an opportunity to go to this magical school and learn about all of the wonderful things he's seen and what he's learned and discovered. That there's basically like this secret magical community like hiding in the shadows of our real world. Amari isn't as taken with the idea of going off to some magical school as she is with the potential of learning more about what happened to Quentin. She wants to go to this school and try and uncover what has happened to him, gather as much information about him, what he's been doing for the last few years and see if she can find him. And this school is a little bit different to just like a regular everybody goes to class kind of school. Instead, right at the beginning, each of the students has to basically get given a superpower. Uh, they basically go up to like this crystal ball and they put their hand on it and it sort of assigns them like a level or a rank of potential. And then they also, based on their own personal strengths, it sort of like enhances 
that strength and gives them like a bit of a power. So if someone's really neat and tidy, they might become like a super powerful organizer. If someone's really fit and athletic, they might become super strong. When Amari goes up, not only is she surprised to get the highest rank of potential, which she didn't really want, she wanted to more play it cool and blend in, but she gets the highest rank of potential and then she puts her hand onto the crystal and it cracks and it sort of tells everybody that she's a magician. And in this world, magicians are illegal. We find out pretty soon that people are terrified of magicians and there is this other magician who's sort of like the super dark lord um, who's plotting to take down the bureau and the school. Amari does draw sort of connections between her experience of being a black girl at her pre prestigious school and now being a magician um, and just how people make assumptions about her based on things that she cannot control and how she's always having to prove herself to be good, to be innocent, to be worthy. There's plenty more that happens. It's really fun. I love Amari and I just, I love a lot of the characters. I think for me, I definitely want to read book two. I don't want to deter you from reading this. I think for me, the pacing just felt very off and some of the writing was a little bit clunky. Some parts just felt so action packed, so fast paced that you could barely keep up and it almost felt like there wasn't room for the wonder and the magical to sort of just really take you away, sweep you away. But then there were other moments that just really took their time and slowed qu down quite a lot. And sometimes I wish that we'd spent more times in other areas than we did in the ones that we did, if that makes sense. All of that having said, and I, I really wanna stress that I did like this. I thought it was really fun. And honestly, there's just so much promise and potential in here. And I'm just really excited to continue with the story. I think this was a solid setup uh, with just plenty more room for growth. Then we ended up catching the bus and the train home from Batemans Bay to Melbourne. It was a 12 hour travel day. So I listened to an audiobook actually. I had an advanced audio copy of I Kissed Sharla Wheeler uh, by Casey McQuiston. And oh boy, did I dislike this book. I was really surprised. I listened to One Last Stop when it first came out and I really, really liked that. I thought it was really fun, really warm, really sweet, but also just really in place in New York City and I, I just really really enjoyed it. This one did not have any of the warmth, any of the charm and I didn't feel any of the romance that One Last Stop did. I honestly found this frustrating and tedious and I did not like it. And I'm really, really sad to say that, honestly, especially because as a children's bookseller, I mean, we already sell One Last Stop and Red, White, Royal Blue all the time. Casey McQuiston is obviously huge on TikTok um, and young people love their books. I Kiss Charlotte Wheeler is their first technically, officially YA book. And of course, I don't have to personally love a book to be able to find the right person to recommend it to but I was disappointed that I didn't love this more. I've heard people describe this as a bit of like a Paper Towns by John Green's vibe. It's been a long time since I read that book. Um, for me, it felt kind of like if you take 13 Reasons Why, not the terrible suicide rep to be very, very clear, but just like the, the mysterious girl that we don't know a whole lot about having left clues and notes for people, along with the kind of toxic manipulative vibe that that show gave me and mixed it with something like Gossip Girl or Glee. And I think for me, that was my main biggest criticism with this book is that tonally, it didn't work for me. It felt like it was trying to be two very different things at the same time. It didn't bring those two themes or tones together and it didn't do either of them very well. Basically, we follow these characters in their last month or two of high school. Charlotte Wheeler is the super popular, beautiful, very intelligent girl. She's sort of like the it girl at school. And the night of prom, I think she basically disappears. Before doing so though, she has kissed three people. Chloe, who is our main protagonist and who she has this really intense, sort of academic rivalry with. Smith, her boyfriend of two years, who's sort of like the jock, the cool kid. And Rory, who's kind of like the quiet skater boy next door. She kisses these three people and then she disappears and she's left them different notes and clues to sort of bring them together to find her. And I just, I did not like this from start to finish. I didn't enjoy it. I did not like the characters, especially Chloe and Sharla. They were both just so competitive and I do not have a competitive bone in my body. So I just found it so grating. Their whole relationship is basically that they kind of hate each other. They both want to be valed valedictorian. They're both brilliant. Um, and like, they just have this massive rivalry. Chloe despises Sharla because she thinks Sharla's horrible and nobody else can see it. So she's sort of like obsessed with her in a weird way. Smith and Rory are more interesting and I think more dynamic characters. But overall, all of this just felt so rooted in jealousy, pettiness, 
And I just found it frustrating. I didn't find that compelling. It was just like overly angsty and frustrating to me. There was a bit of exploration around all of these kids in Alabama in a small town in a very religious school, sort of figuring themselves out, whether that's their identity, sexuality, race, like just, just so much around identity and belonging and a sense of self in a very restrictive, sometimes harmful environment. And Casey McQuiston's writing, like the actual writing is wonderful. It's just as good as from what I remember from One Last Stop. But that is where the positives end for me. I did not like the romance. I did not like the ending. I did not like the journey. I just did not enjoy this book. And I'm really, really sad to say that. But after I finished that, I did jump into Lenny's Book of Everything by Karen Foxley. This is another middle grade. I think it's from about 2018. I have read another book by Karen Foxley. I read Dragon Skin, which I loved. And I had heard that this one had a similar sort of atmosphere, but maybe even sadder. This one is set in the 70s, somewhere in America. And we basically follow Lenny or Lenore. Uh, she is about three years old when her little brother Davy is born. Lenny, Davy, and their mum are like the main characters in this book. Uh, their father does sort of just disappear when Lenny's about five from memory, leaving Lenny's mum to be a single mother of two young children in America in the 70s. So it's pretty rough. For a few years, everything is fairly normal for this young family. Um, that is until Davy starts growing and he starts growing very, very quickly. You know, by the time he's five, he's as tall as an eight year old. By the time he's six, he's you know, as tall as his mum or taller. And at first this causes some smaller problems in terms of Davy's schooling and his acceptance. Um, but as the story progresses, it becomes like quite a significant health crisis and just emotional crisis for this entire family. And this book, I will say outright, is very slow paced. I tend to be someone who likes slow pace, but I don't, I don't know, I haven't experienced a whole lot of very slow paced books in middle fiction. It's also just really quite down. Like even before the health crisis becomes evident with Davy, just so much of their life is just really sad and dire and just not happy. It's basically a story about love, all the different kinds of love in all of its complexities. I mean, it has that sort of like beautiful, touching, moving sadness to it, if that makes sense. Like it's, it's an affirmation on life and love by the end but it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's an enjoyable read. I did quite like the ending. I did find it quite moving, but I didn't find it as impactful as I was expecting to, to be honest. I'm someone who is very into emotional reads. I love to cry when I read, and this just didn't really hit me in the way that I was expecting it to. Karen Foxley's writing is beautiful. It's so atmospheric and emotional. And that is true from my experience of Dragon Skin. I love Karen Foxley's writing. One of the things that I did really like about this was quite early on, Lenny's mum wins uh, like a free subscription to this encyclopedia. And so every week they get sent like small volumes of an encyclopedia. And Lenny and Davy just love this thing and they look forward to it every week and they sort of like get really obsessed with certain elements of the encyclopedia, like Lenny becomes obsessed with bugs, whereas Davy's really into birds. And there was something about that juxtaposition between their small life being so difficult and complicated and emotional and them having so much curiosity for the larger world and yet this encyclopedia that can tell them everything about, you know, the world and give them all the definitions they could possibly, they could possibly need, at the end of the day, it didn't really give them any information or certainly any tools that they really needed to deal with real life. And so I did quite like that. I thought that was quite beautiful. And finally, the other book that I did read while I was away was The Well of Ascension by Brandon Sanderson. This is book two of the Mistborn series. And boy, do I have thoughts on this book. Uh, I'm doing a whole separate vlog on this book. So be on the lookout for that if you would like to hear my thoughts on this. In case you can't tell by my face, I was not, no, no, absolutely not. But anyway, those are the books that I read during the two and a bit weeks that I was away in Batemans Bay. I hope you enjoyed following along. I hope you enjoyed these book reviews and I will see you hopefully when I'm feeling a bit better in the next video. Until then, so much love. Bye.